How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. My name is Ty. I am one of the pastors here. It's great to be with you. If, if you know me, um, I am unapologetically a shameless promoter. Like, if I find a deal somewhere and we talk about it, I'm going to tell you all about it. If I find a product that I like, I'm going to tell everyone about it. Like, recently, I, I found this thing called Rocketbook. Has anybody ever heard of a Rocketbook? Yeah, those things are amazing. They're like a never-ending notebook that like, you take notes on, you scan it, it goes over to Google Drive, wherever you want it to, and then you erase it, and so you buy one notebook, and you, it lasts forever. Or, or there's this thing, this app I have on my phone called Groovebook. You know, all the, um, all the pictures you have on your phone you do nothing with? This actually will, you can upload 100 uh, pictures per month, and it sends it right to your house for $3.99 per book. Send it to your grandma. She loves it. Anyway, <laughs> I'm a shameless promoter, and here's why. The point is, What I experience or what I have experienced, what brings me joy and happiness in life, I want you to experience it well. And I believe, I don't know why I believe this, I believe if you don't experience what I'm experiencing, well, then your life's not going to be that good. It's just not, like, it's like without what I'm going to tell you, it's going to stink because I have experienced it and I love it so much. Well, today in our text, that's kind of the point of what we're getting at. Whenever we see something that brings life, we want everyone to know what brings life. We share it with others. And what we're going to see from the text today in the Bible, in the book of John, is we're going to see this this theme emerge, that found people find people. People who have been found by God end up going out and finding other people so they may be found by God as as well. But uh, So what I want to do is I I want you today to, uh, to, to hear this message for yourself. You ever like hear something and you hear it for someone else? Like when the preacher says something or someone says something, you nudge your wife or you nudge your husband like, that's for you? No, no. It's for you today, okay? So just you can just tell yourself, this is for me. Keep your elbows locked into the side. You got to hear this first for yourself. But as you hear this today, I'm going to tell you a come and see statement four times over. Four times over. I'm going to ask you four questions and give you four come and see, because this whole series of the book of John, we've been saying come and see, come and see. I'm going to give you four statements that I want you to answer the question for yourself and see these statements for yourself, but then we'll also have a go and blank. We said go and do this. I want you to go and tell other people about this as well. I I want you to realize as you answer the questions I'm going to give you today, everyone else in this world is asking the same questions. You are not that unique. That You're not a special snowflake like your grandmother told you. Humanity is all about the same when it comes down to it. And so the questions that you have are the questions I'm going to ask today. Other people in the world have as well. And I'm going to give you answers, or you're actually going to find the answer for it today and be able to answer those questions. Make sense? Probably not yet, but let me dive to this. If you've got a Bible, go to John chapter 1. We're still in the first chapter of John. Been in there for about, I don't know, four or five weeks now. John chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, here at Grace Point Church, we always say you're going to need a Bible. Why? We lead, teach, and preach from the Bible. And so we've done you a solid. We have English and Spanish ones out at Center Point. Just walk by and grab one. We have the Grace Point Vegas app that's got the free stuff on there as well, and a full Bible. And then we'll put it up on the big jumbotrons on the side. Cool? John chapter 1. We got a lot of work to do and a limited amount of time before they turn my mic off. Are you ready? All right. John 1, verse 35. You ready to do some work? Okay, let's do some work. The next day, and so we've been going through the book of John, and so like last week was the day before, so now it's the next day. The next day again, John, remember, this is not John the guy writing the book. This is John the baptizer or John the Baptist. He was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus. So Jesus walked by, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this. These these were John disciples. They heard him say this, and what they do? Well, they followed Jesus. Now, if you remember last week, John said kind of the same thing. He said, he, he said look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, this is what John was telling everyone. Now, is this good news or bad news? What kind of news is this? Well, when he says, behold, that Jesus is the Lamb, what we've discovered last week, and if you missed that, you can go back and listen to it, but the Lamb that he's talking about is the Lamb from the Old Testament, and what do lambs do? They die. They're sacrifices. And you have to start asking the question, what are they dying for? They're dying for the sins of people. And so what he's doing is he's saying, behold, Jesus is the one who's going to die for your sins. And so this is bad news, but it's also good news as well. Jesus is going to die, but it's for the sins of those who would trust him. So two of John's disciples heard John say this. Now imagine John's got his group with him. That's his boys. And all of a sudden he's like, behold, the Lamb of God. And they're like, deuces, John. And they start to follow Jesus because that was John's whole life as a witness. He was just a voice to the word. He was saying, hey, go follow Jesus. I'm just here making a way for people to follow Jesus. 
And what John was saying was, behold, the Lamb of God. He was literally to anyone that would listen to him saying, behold, there's Jesus, and without him, you're toast. Literally speaking, you are. You are dead in your sins without Jesus, separated from God forever without this perfect spotless lamb. This is what's called news, or what we call in the Bible, good news. It's what's called the gospel. Gospel simply means good news. Go- gospel is simple. So there's, type, there's like four types of movement within the gospel. The gospel is simply this. God created us, loves us, and we are to be in a relationship with him. That's good. But then we messed it all up with our sin, and our sin has separated us from God, and we deserve punishment forever as the penalty of our sin. Good news for us, Jesus came and lived in our place, perfect relationship with God, perfectly obeying God, died on a cross for all of us imperfect people, three days later came back to life, 40 days later descended to the right hand of the Father, and then when we trust Jesus, when we give our life to Christ, when he bears the weight of our life and our existence, and then we are saved. That's really good news, right? Maybe some of you grew up in church and you've probably heard of this thing called the Romans Road. Have you heard it? The Romans Road. It's not really a road. I'm sure there's plenty of roads in Rome. But there's a book in the Bible called Romans, and there's like selected verses to where you can respond to the gospel, where you can understand the gospel. It goes something like this. Romans 3.23 says this. For all have sinned, and all means what? Okay, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we've all sinned. Then you get to Romans 6. It says, for the wages of sin is death. So we want, a, we want a payday, right? Well, the payday for our sin is what? But there's a gift. But the, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's a gift. You receive a gift. There's nothing you do to earn the gift, right? You can't work hard enough, be good enough, be religious enough. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's a beautiful verse. You know why? You don't have to get yourself ready or clean up before you meet Jesus. That's like getting clean before you get into a shower. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, no, no, Jesus died for you while we were still sinners, while we were still in our sins. And then Romans 10 famously says, verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe that Jesus is Lord of your life, he is the boss of your life, he is you know, the one that you submit to, you believe with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart at the core of you that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For we're with one's heart, one believes and is justified and with one's mouth confess and be saved. See, this is the good news of the gospel. Very simple, very, very clear. This is the good news of the gospel. Now, remember at the beginning, I said I was going to ask you four questions. Question number one, is this your news? What is your good news? Is this the good news that you believe? Don't answer yet. Because we all have news that we believe, that we believe this is the good news of life. This is how I'm living my life. This is the the gospel of my life. What is your news? Remember, I said, don't answer this for someone beside you. You must answer this for yourself. What's your news? Is your news this good news or is it something else? What else could it be? Are there other good news out there? There are some things out there playing counterfeit good news. Let me give you one within the, within the American church today. Within the westernized church, there's this fake false gospel called, and there's a list, list of them I could come talk about, the prosperity gospel, talk about all kinds of gospels, but there's one, this no gospel at all, it's called moralistic therapeutic deism. Ever heard of it? It's not labeled that way, but what is moralistic therapeutic deism? Well, there's kind of five tenets to it. The first one is this. The belief consists of this. A God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Sounds pretty good, yeah? That's right. Yeah? You with me? You're like, I'm confused. I don't know if you're tricking me. All right. That's okay. Not yet. I'll trick you in a minute. All right. What else? God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. And we hear that and we're like, eh. It's a little ambiguous, but mm, all right. Let's, another one. The central goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. It's like, oh, um, life is not always happy. Am I right? There's a lot of unhappy. that, ha- and, and the Bible shows us there's a lot of suffering, isn't there? And that God allows suffering and trials at times. So wait a minute. Now, now we've kind of come off the rails. Another one. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. It's like God is vanilla ice. Vanilla ice. If there was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. No. <laughs> but that's the idea of like, God is kind of aloof and like, I don't really need him until something's bad. Then like, all right, God, I need you. Come over here. And then lastly, good people go to heaven when they die. 
moralistic, teach me how to be good, therapeutic, make me feel good, make me feel happy, deism, let's give some kind of ambiguous lowercase g God language to it. This, my friends, listen to me. Maybe this is what you've believed. This is not biblical. This is not good news. It's bad news. It's not, that's not the gospel. That's not the one of Jesus coming and living in our place. That's not the one of Jesus dying on the cross and that we surrender our lives to Christ. He rose from the grave, defeating sin, Satan, and death. This is not, that's good about morality. Morality is really good at keeping you out of jail, but it won't keep you out of hell. Like We understand this, correct? And so, I mean, but it's, it, that's, this is not... This is not this is not good news. This is not Christianity. It may sell in Christian bookstores and it may sell on Christian radio, but it doesn't mean it's Christian if it's in either one of those. See, that's actually bad news. See, no, Jesus, what John says, is the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God. When you think God, when you talk about God, you got to start talking about Jesus because it's all about Jesus. So what, what is your news? What's your good news? I told you I would have four questions, four come and see statements. The come and see statement is this. Jesus has the best news. Jesus has the best news. It's the best news of you can't do it on your own. It's, it's the best news that you can't be religious enough, good enough, moral enough. No, no, no. Jesus does the work for us, and we trust Jesus. That's good news. Now, that I said each and every week we're going to have go and blank. Go and tell others. Everyone's got news. Everyone is believing something where they say, I believe nothing. Well, they believe something about nothing. They believe something. And so go and tell. You've got the best news. Be a shameless promoter like I am. Tell them. All right. Well, some of you may say, well, Ty, I don't, I don't know how to go tell people about this good news. Lucky for you, in our community groups, we're doing an eight-week study called Gospel 101. And we're going to be learning about the gospel, internalizing the gospel, and then going out and sharing the gospel and coming back together and talking about what did it look like to ask people questions, do things in non-intrusive, non-evasive kind of ways, just everyday or ordinary fluent ways. What does that look like? And so if you're not in a community group, I beg you to get in one. I beg you. Like to do this in community. We have these books for sale, Gospel 101 out there, but like they're fine and dandy by themselves, but they're supposed to be used in the context of community. Shameless plug. All right, verse 38. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, community group's where it's at. I'm in a community group. I love my community group. Any of my community group people in here? That's right, see? All right, cool. <laughs> I'm in one. I, I love it. Verse 38. Let's keep going. That's question number one. Let's keep moving. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? It's a great question that Jesus asked. Here's the way that question's kind of framed up for question number two. What do you want? You ever stop and just ask yourself that question? What do, what do I want? Well, well, Jesus is asking this question. What do you want? And I think that question's posed to us as well. What do we want? Do we want Jesus or do we want Jesus stuff? Do we want the face of God, meaning this personal intimate relation with God, or do we just want the hand of God of like, just give me my stuff? I think that's a great question to ask because, listen, all people in all of life and all humans want the hand of God. Whether they call it the hand of God or not, they want the good life. They want some peace. They want some patience. They want some health. They want some sanity. They want some security. They want all these things and not want God whatsoever. And, and, and like the question coming to us is, what do you want? If we're not careful, here's what happens. So many of us will dabble with religion to get God's benefits and not God himself. See, we, we, we read in this text that they followed Jesus. They went after Jesus. If we are followers of Jesus, that means we love Jesus, we want Jesus, we want God's face, not just the stuff. We want to follow Jesus. Yes, we're poor and spiritually bankrupt, and without God, we have nothing. And by his good grace, he gives all of us life. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus today, even if you don't believe there's a God whatsoever, even if you're an atheist in here today, here's the reality. God gave you a gift this morning. Breathe it in. It's called life. And it's a benefit from God. See, the difference between a Christian and a person who's not a Christian, a Christian wants Jesus. A Christian follows Jesus. Maybe you just want the benefits of God only, and you don't want God. 
But what they are is that you get a package deal. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers, he said this. He says, are you seeking pardon? He said, you shall found it in me, which means Jesus. Are you seeking peace? I will give you rest. Are you seeking purity? I will take away your sin. A new heart I will give you and a right spirit I'll put within you. What are you seeking? What do you want? Some solid resting place for your soul upon earth and a glorious hope for yourself in heaven. Wherever you seek, it is here in Christ. Question, what? What do you, do you really want Jesus? That's like, what a great question. Are you just doing Christian things, Christianish things? Do you really want Jesus? Come and see. Come and see statement number two. Come and see that Jesus is everything you've been looking for. If you were with us a few weeks ago, man, we, we hammered that out for a long time, so I won't belabor it long, but everything you've looked for in life, peace, joy, happiness, love, everything, hope, security, approval, acceptance, identity, value, everything you've been looking for is in Jesus. Everything. So now, go and tell others. Everyone wants something. Show them that what they want is just pointed to someone greater named Jesus. Like everyone wants to be a, a acceptance. Show them that their great ex, greatest acceptance can be in Christ. Everybody wants security. Tell them their greatest security can be in Christ. You see what, like, like he's everything you've ever wanted. Go and tell people. Second half, 38. Let's keep going. Making sense? All right. I'll, I'm going to try to confuse you, but we'll see. And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. Come and you will see. I love that. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. I think that's like 4 o'clock, I believe. Uh, one of the two that heard John speak and followed, followed Jesus was, okay, so he's going to talk about the two that followed him, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So if you're familiar with the Bible, there's a dude by the name of Peter. He's pretty famous in the Bible. This is his brother, Andrew. He first found his own brother, Simon, which is Peter, and said to him, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. Interesting, uh, Andrew had not known Jesus for 24 hours and was already going and telling other people about Jesus. If we're not careful, some of us have known Jesus for 24 days and not said a peep about him, 24 weeks and not said anything, 24 months and not said much. Many, many of you maybe have followed Jesus over 24 years and not told other people about Jesus. We see Andrew right here, man, within 24 hours, just getting at it. He brought him to Jesus. He brought Peter to Jesus. What if that was the story of our lives? We just bring people to Jesus, either meaning we tell them about Jesus, we bring them into our family right here and say, hey, uh, I don't know a whole lot about Jesus, but here's what I do know. He loves me, saved me. Why don't you come and be a part of this community? They're skeptical. They don't have all their answers, but come and be a part of this. Let me, let me bring you to the people that love Jesus and listen to what they say about Jesus. He said he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. Man, Jesus is an imposing dude. Imagine me introducing you to somebody. Hey, this is my friend Bill. And Bill looks at you. Yeah, I know your name's Bob, but now you're going to be known as Tom. Okay. <laughs> it's like, he just, changed, he just changed his name right there. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, the second guy. And he said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida and the city of Andrew and Peter. So here's the question number three. Who or what do you follow? You notice he said to Philip right here? He's like, just follow me. He's like, all right. Okay. Everyone is following something or someone. Each and every person in here. We're following, we're following an idea. We're following a parent, a peer, a philosophy, a religion, a career, a culture. We're following something. Our life is all about heading in a direction. Each and every one of us is heading in some kind of direction, some kind of trajectory. Now, interesting in the text, they call Jesus rabbi. And rabbi means teacher. And so um, the rabbi, the teacher, would have disciples. You know, John had disciples. Jesus has the disciples. And the disciples were following Jesus. Now, now, back in that day, the disciple would learn everything from the teacher. They would not only listen to the teacher and obey the teacher, but they would fo like physically follow the teacher. So imagine Jesus walking with a bunch of dudes like really close to him. So much so, they walked so close to when Jesus would stop, they'd almost like bump into him. It's like he had a shadow. And the idea was that you were supposed to walk so closely behind your teacher, so closely behind your rabbi, that the sand and the dirt and the mud from his sandals would flick up on you, and so the front of your robe would be covered with your master's or your teacher's dust. Now, being from the country, uh, we always like four-wheelers and, and mud and trucks and all. Anybody, 
And one of the fun things to do with the four-wheelers, when people got behind you and you turn really fast and just shoot mud all over them, and they'd be covered with your mud. Well, the idea is that we would be so close to Christ that we'd be covered with his mud. We'd be covered with his, his dirt. We're covered with somebody's. We're following something or some, so we're covered with. So see, we can talk a lot about following Jesus, but then our, our walk will, will determine if we really are or not. The dirt on our front. So is the dust of Jesus or an idol on you? What's on the front of your robe? The dust of Jesus or an idol? Now, you may say, well, Ty, what is an idol? I don't have an idol in my closet that I bow down to, light candles who worship me. No, no, no. An idol is anything that we put in God's place. It can be an idea, a concept, a person, a theory, anything like that, to where we're trying to get our ultimate happiness from, to where we're trying to get our, our identity, our value, our worth, our purpose. That can be an idol. Idols are typically good things that have gone really bad in our hearts. We begin to, to treasure something above Jesus. Jesus picks up on this in Matthew 21. He says this, For where your treasure is, your idol is, there your heart will be also. So the question is, don't answer out loud, what do you treasure? Don't answer out loud. What is your greatest treasure? Because what you treasure is what you follow. There is a trail leading to your treasure in your life. See, we may say we treasure and follow Jesus above all, but how's that play out practically in your life? How's that play out in how you spend your time? How's that play out in how you spend your energy? How's that play out in how you spend your affections and what your heart is drawn to and your love is drawn to? How's that play out in the time of your money? And I know preachers are not supposed to talk about money, but there's a reality of like our time and our money. Some of us, we can write checks all day long, but just don't mess with my time. Some of us like, don't mess, you know, I can give you all the time in the world, don't ask for my money. But like, it doesn't, aren't those things kind of showing us where our, our treasure is? Jesus, I think Jesus said that. See, if we follow the trail from our heart to our lives, we find what we treasure. What is it that you treasure most? What is it that you follow? Money? Image? Sex? Altering your reality? Status? Convenience? Pleasure? Nationalism? That's a big deal now. Power? Ever wonder why there's such a breakdown between our talk and our walk, or our confession and our life? You figure out the breakdown, you'll start seeing what your idols are. I love what Richard Key says. He says, in the most basic level, idols are what we make out of the evidence for God within ourselves and in the world if we do not want to face the face of God himself in his majesty and holiness. So we don't want to face God in his majesty and holiness, and so what do we do? We make idols. Why is that? Rather than look to the creator and have to deal with his lordship, rather than look to God and have to deal with him being over us and him being the authority in our life and him being the truth and the right and the perfect, what do we do? We orient our lives toward the creation where we can be more free to control and shape our lives in our desired direction. However, since we were made to relate to God but do not want to face him, we forever inflate things in this world to religious proportions to fill the vacuum left by God's exclusion. Did you, did you catch that? Man, that stuff is in tune right there. Because we exclude God, we have to inflate the things of creation to a religious proportion in order to fill the vacuum in which excluding God has caused us. That's what we do. See, you and I cannot exclude God from our thinking and, and priorities and expect to do well in life. We can't. I mean, we'll only be able to do that for a, a little while with the pharmaceutical industry, with sporting industry, with the entertainment industry, with some other industry. To, it'll only sustain this for only a while after we abandon God, but it will leave, leave us feeling broken, lacking, and missing. Why is that? Because we will need something in our lives to compensate for the absence of God and the absence of a robust love of Jesus. That's why we, we all follow something or someone else. And all the drugs, the entertainment, sports, sex, the money status will never do. They'll always fall short and leave us wanting for more. They'll ens they enslave us. They enslave us. Louis Giglio said this, some of us attend the church on the corner professing to worship the living God above all. Others who rarely darken the church doors would say worship isn't a part of their lives because they aren't religious, but everyone has an altar, you know, something you sacrifice on. And every altar has a throne. So how do you know where and what you worship? It's easy. You simply follow the trail of your time, your affections, your energy, your money, your allegiance. 
At the end of that trail, you'll find a throne, and whatever or whomever is on that throne is what is of highest value to you. On that throne is what you worship. Sure, not too many of us walk around saying, I worship my stuff, I worship my job, I worship pleasure, I worship her, I worship my body, I worship me, but the trail never lies. We may say we value the things, this, this thing or that thing more than other things, but the volume of our actions speak louder than our words. In the end, our worship is more about what we do than what we say. If we really start to look at our lives and kind of follow the trail to see whose dirt is on the front of us, we start to see the ugly disconnect between our confessional theology and our, func- and our functional practicality. What we say and what we do, we start to see a chasm as wide as the Grand Canyon sometimes, don't we? We are all in need of grace of God for sure. This is where we find our idols. This is where we find what we're following. This is what we find, that we, what we give allegiance to our life. So how do we find it? Well, the easiest way to find the idol is what, what brings you ultimate satisfaction. What can you not live without? What, if we're removed from you, would just devastate you and you couldn't go on? What is it that you find your identity from? Let me give you just a few primers that may help jumpstart of like what could potentially be the idol in your life. Image. You have to have a certain look or a certain body type, certain body image. Helping. If if people are dependent on you and need you, you feel complete. If they don't, then you're just devastated. Independence. If you're completely free from responsibility and obligations, then you feel like life is worth living. Work. If you're highly productive and you get things done and people admire you at your work and you're a boss. Materialism. If you have a certain amount of wealth, you have enough zeros in the bank with, with whole numbers in front of it, of course, and you have enough stuff and you have the newest and bright, then you finally. Religion. That you do enough religion to really just keep, keep yourself feeling good about all your religious activity to where you feel like I'm a good person or at least better than the person beside me. Being an individual person. If I'm just alone and no one bothers me, then that's when I'm alive. Being an irreligious person, you're free from the tyranny of organized religion, you have a self-made morality. Racial and cultural, if my race and culture are ascended and recognized as superior over others. Inner circle, if a particular social or professional group lets me in, then I feel like family. Oh my gosh, my spouse and my kids, if everything's the way it should be and nothing's disordered, nothing's disrupted, and then suffering. If I'm hurting or in a problem, only then do I feel noble, worthy, or loved. Remember, some of these things, some of those things are good in and of themselves, but they were never meant to bear the weight of your life. The tension you probably feel is because something has taken God's place in your life. What dust is on you? Remember back in in John, they're described as following Jesus. Listen, there is no Christianity without following Jesus. It's, it's not heard of. There's not a like, Christian by name, but not by life. It's unheard of. Christians follow Jesus. We don't follow our own way. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Who or what do you follow? You have to answer that for yourself. Come and see that Jesus is worth following, though. Jesus is worth following. Like, he's worth giving your whole life to. He is worth every decision, all your time, resource, energy, effort. All that is worth following Jesus and living out the ways of Christ. It's worth it. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is kind. He is loving. He's powerful. He's worth following. Now, go and tell others. Everyone's following something that's leading them down a path of death. It may be satisfying for a moment, but we know where it's leading. The path of Christ leads to life. Life to the fullest. Do we believe that, right? Three of us believe that. We believe that, right? <laughs> yeah, we do. Let me keep going. Verse 45. Philip found Nathaniel. Do you see all these people finding people? People finding, found people, they find people. And they tell people about Jesus. Well, Philip, he found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him on whom Moses in the law and also the prophet wrote. What are you saying? He says, we know our Old Testament, all the Old Testament's about Jesus. We have found him. So he goes and tells his boy, Nathaniel, hey, we found him. That's what happens. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he says, it's Jesus of Nazareth, place, kind of like Podunk, Podunk, kind of nowheresville town. Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
That's what he said. He's like, there's, that's a no, that's Chiggerville, USA. There's nothing going on there. Nothing good comes out of that place whatsoever. He, yeah. No one knows what that place is. He's just like, just, he, he doubts, he doubts that's the one that they talked about, that the Old Testament talks about. Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. I love that. Just think about your workplace. Think about your school. Think about your neighborhood when people talk bad about Jesus or talk bad about the church, because there's enough to talk bad about the church for sure. Enough, you know, and, and if you say, hey, just, I, I, hear, I hear your struggles with the church. I hear your struggles with Jesus. I hear your struggle with the Bible. Just come and see. What if, you, what if that was your answer to people around you to say, just come and see. Come and see, this, come and see this Savior. Come and see with me this family of God together as we come and see Jesus. What that, that's beautiful. Come and see. That's not threatening, is it? That's not offensive. That's like, don't put your religion on me. I'm just saying, hey, come and see. Come and see. I love that. Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said, behold. There's another behold word. An Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Man, that's a really nice thing for Jesus, Jesus to say. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. This dude was doubting. Now he's like, no, 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 you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than this. I love that. So here's my last question. Just like Nathaniel, what are your doubts? What are your doubts? It's honest time in church, so we're going to play honesty. You ready? You have doubts, and I do too. I do. I've been following Jesus for about 19 years, something like that, about 19 years now. I met Jesus. We met Jesus in our 20s, and um, I've, I've had doubts. I, one, I doubted. I, I didn't think I'd ever be a Christian, let alone a pastor. I was like, that wasn't my, that wasn't my scene. Um, but over 19 years, I've had my doubts. I remember when I trusted Jesus, I prayed the prayer. You know, you pray the prayer. I prayed, prayed the prayer. And about six months after that, my life was going down the toilet. And I had all these doubts about God and just like me and him and this and that. And I remember praying this foolish prayer, but it's all I had. I said, God, if you're real, like I give you my whole life. Don't, don't screw it up. <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> I mean, like I didn't know what else to say to him. I was like, just don't mess up. He didn't. Uh, and, and, you know, for a while, life was great. You remember when you first trusted Jesus? Like, like you're high on Christ. It's like, this is the best thing ever. I mean, you're reading the Bible, and you're praying, you're telling people about Jesus. It's awesome. But then something happens. That, like, it feels like the newness wears off a little bit, doesn't it? Let's, I mean, honest time. It feels like it wears off a little bit. Maybe you read your Bible a little less, or it just doesn't seem as shiny and awesome as it was. Maybe your prayer's a little bit different. Maybe you just don't tell a lot of people because you're a little bit more reserved now. And it just it feels, it feels like, you know, just... Just doubts come on. I remember after I followed Jesus, they asked me to work with kids. I was like, I don't know the Bible. I'm like, why am I going to work with kids? And I had all these doubts of like, I'm not, you got the wrong guy. Like, you don't know my life before I met Jesus. This is bad. And like, you want me to go and like teach kids? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay. And like all these just, just doubts of like trying to do anything like that. Some of you have those doubts too. Like you won't serve anywhere because you, you're, you're so afraid. So, just doubt. How can God use me? <laughs> if he can use me, he can use anybody. I remember um, just as a pastor, I do funerals now. And when I do funerals, I look in the casket, and I realize there's no one home. They're there, but they're not there. And, and then, I, then I have a little bit of doubt every once in a while. I got really, I'm like, God, Jesus, will you be there when I die? Because I'm heading there. We're, like, newsflash, we're all, we're all going there. No, like it's, you're not going to escape death. It's just a reality unless Jesus returns. And I'm like, Jesus, will, will you, will you be there? See, doubts will happen. What are you going to do when you doubt? What's going to happen when you doubt? Some of you are here for that very reason. You have, you, you're doubting God, and you're just trying to kick the tires on God. Are you real? Are you there? I'm, I'm glad you're here. I really am. We're honored that you're here. I'm going to be honest with you, though. I've been following Jesus 19 years now. I still have doubts. I don't have 48 steps to like, here's how you get rid of all your doubts. <laughs> all I have is Jesus and him crucified. I'll have Jesus is him, him from the grave. All I have Jesus is his, his word right here. Let me, let, me, maybe, let me help you with the Bible as best I can. Jesus answers Nathaniel's doubt 
with contrasting him to Jacob. Did you see that? He called, he said, an Israelite without deceit. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Maybe you've heard of them, maybe not. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob, Jacob's name means deceit or deceitful, liar, grasper, struggler. You know, it's not, that's not good. And um, so he, 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 it's a bad deal. He was running from uh, Esau. He ripped him off. He took the birthright and all that, deceived his father. Bad deal. And so later on, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Right. Good job. Changed to Israel. And Nathaniel knew this story. But more than that, Jesus knew Nathaniel. Look back at the text. I want you to see it's verse 48. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. And then Nathaniel goes through his whole confession of like, oh, you're the king and the Lord. Jesus knows all. We realize that, right? There's an omniscience about Jesus. See, Nathaniel didn't find Jesus. Jesus found him. And one of the things that helps me with my doubt is I didn't find God like God is lost out in the middle of the woods without a compass. No, no, no. I'm the lost one, and he found me. When did he find me? That's a great question because this really helps me just anchor myself in God even more. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, it'll tell you. Even as he chose us in him when? Before the foundations of the world. You know how comforting that is? Before anything existed, before I ever existed and screwed everything up, he found me. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Let me tell you what I am not right now, holy and blameless. But he, he will complete what he starts, and that's the, that's a, then that helps me with my doubts as well. I'm going to try to lean and live into that as much as I can by the grace and power of God. But he chose us to be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption. Before I ever was, he says, mine. You remember like calling dibs back in the day when like, you know, there'd be one cookie left, you lick it and put it back down, dibs. <laughs> well, before creation, God, dibs, his. Adoption to himself as sons through Christ, Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. It's not, I'm not outside of his will. I live in the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace to which he has blessed us in the beloved. Augustine or Augustine, wherever you're from, he said this. We could not even have begun to seek God unless he already found us. Why? We were dead in our sins, Ephesians go on to say. It's just beautiful. See, although you and I, were going to struggle with doubts, we have a God who knows us. He knows us before we even were. So be honest. Be honest with Jesus about your doubts. He can handle that. There's a dude in uh, one of the Gospels in the, the, the book of Matthew, and he, I can't remember. His son was either dead or dying or something was really bad happening. And he goes up to Jesus, and it's the best prayer, one of my favorite prayers of the Bible. He says this, verse 24, Mark. He says, immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, best prayer ever, I believe. And then what does he say next? Help me in my unbelief. <laughs> you get more, no more honest than that. Help me in my unbelief. Like, that's the most honest prayer ever. The Greek word for unbelief means not fully persuaded, not there yet. That's what it means. I believe I'm just not there yet. I'm not fully there yet. I'm not fully persuaded, God. That's what he's saying right there. That's where some of you are at today. Some of you husbands are here only because you're wives. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. I know what I was there. I was there in your seat. Angie would go. I'm like, all right, <laughs> cool. Not really, but okay. And you're here because you want to appease her, or you're just like, man, kudos to you just trying to be a good husband. You're not there yet. I get it. Some of you are college students, and you, you, had, a, you had a faith, maybe a little waffly, flimsy faith, until you went to college, and, and you had a philosophy class that blew you up. Dude, it, it ate your lunch. It did. And you're like, I don't know, I don't know what I believe anymore. So, some of you have had faith in Christ here, and, and, and like you've suffered and you feel like God has not shown up, God has been distant, and I've been under these trials and this suffering and these, these tribulations, and, I, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Listen, listen. How much faith do you have? Do you have 99% faith? Do you have 40% faith? Listen, listen. Do you have 1% faith? Because Jesus says something very interesting in the Gospels. He said the faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. You know how, size, how big a mustard seed is? It's one of the smallest seeds of all. See, listen to me. It's not the size of your faith. It's the object of your faith. 
And so we trust it. So if you have 1%, 40% or not, just go with it. Lord, I believe, help me. Uh, Again, Augustine or Augustine, he said, he said, life is all about faith, seeking, understanding. I trust you. I'm seeking to understand this guy. See, you're going to have doubts. I'm going to have doubts. Jesus says, because I said to you in verse 50, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Some people say seeing is believing, not in the kingdom of God. <laughs> believing is seeing. And when God, God, I don't see it yet. Help me. What are your doubts? Come and see that Jesus can handle your doubts and go and tell others. Everybody out there has got doubts. Let them know, like, man, there's some doubts I have too, but and Jesus hasn't answered them all yet. But I trust. I trust. That'll mess you up on it. A little bit. Okay. Last verse. I love how he ends this. He says, and he said to him, Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, what he's doing, he's referring to the Old Testament. He's going back to Jacob again. Jacob was tired, fell asleep, had a vision of God, like there was this ladder or their stairway, you know, the Zeppelin stairway to heaven. There's a stairway. And angels were going up and down. Now, heaven open. You know what heaven open means in this verse? That there's acceptance from God. How do we have acceptance from God? Starts with a J, ends with a Jesus. It's just Jesus. Like, that's the only way. He, that's, we, like, Jesus is the ladder. This is talking about Jacob's ladder. Maybe you've been in church for a while. Jacob's ladder, or, the, or every time you hear Zepp's, you know, stairway to heaven, just think, that's Jesus. Not in the lyrics, but you get what I'm saying. But Jesus is the ladder. Jesus is the escalator to heaven. You know, we talk about, you know, people will say, well, you know, God's on top of a mountain. There's many different paths. God's not on top of a mountain. God's in heaven, far from us, and there's nothing we can do about that. Aha, but there's a ladder. Aha, there's an escalator. Aha, Jesus is the one. He's, and then he says, there's these angels ascending and descending. Did you see that in the text? There's like, there's, there's like God is active in our lives. Not only is he powerful, not only is Jesus the provisions we need to have a relationship with God, not only is he the provisions we need for heaven, but he also gives us protection. Did you know we have ministering angels? Don't think in guardian angels and, and TV shows. Think about like there's ministering angels that protect. If God loves, he protects us. I'll tell you one story and then we'll, I'll be done. There's, uh, it was a dark night about 100 years ago. A Scottish missionary named John G. Patton and his wife found themselves surrounded by cannibals intended on taking their lives. On that terror-filled night, the couple fell to their knees and prayed that God would protect them. It was a horrible time. Intermittent with their prayers, the missionaries heard the cries of the savages and imagined them coming through the doors to take their lives. As the sun began to rise, to their astonishment, they found that the natives were retreating into the forest. The missionaries were uh, uh, absolutely amazed and filled with joy their hearts soared to God. It was a day of rejoicing. The couple bravely continued their work. A year later, one year later, the chieftain of that tribe was saved. As the missionary spoke with him, he remembered the horror of the night and asked the chieftain why he and his men had not killed them. The chieftain replied in surprise, who were all those men who were with you? The missionary answered, there were no men with us. It was just me and my, my wife. The chieftain began to argue with him, saying, There were hundreds of tall men in shiny garments with drawn swords swords circling about your house, so we could not attack you. God God not only gives us his grace. Jesus is not only the ladder that provides for us to have a relationship, but God also protects us. See, there's a dying world out there, and yet we have an open heaven because of Jesus. That as Christians, we're called to come and see this goodness of Jesus and not just bottle up for ourselves, but we go and tell others. And I know your fears about telling your your people at work and people within your community and schools, you're going to be about as popular as a white crayon. I get it. I get it. (laughs) But there's a reality. There's a, I'm sorry. There's a reality. I'm sorry. Forgive me. (laughs) I'm sorry. There's a reality. So there's this reality of like you've you've seen the goodness of God. You've seen too much to not be a shameless promoter. You've heard too much to not be a shameless promoter. You are you are the voice of the word. Jesus is the word, then we are the voice that we come and see this goodness of Jesus and we go and tell 
others. We go and invite and say, come and see. Come and see. Because we've, we, we, we've been able to see the glories of Jesus. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray. And then together as a family, we're going to be reminded of this goodness of Jesus. We're going to respond to him through the Lord's Supper, through communion. And then we'll continue to just to worship him. So let me pray for us. Father, you 